Okay, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> um, first, I'd like to thank Ivan for inviting me uh, this evening uh, to talk a little bit about um, the detention center and what we're doing. Um, very valuable support service that, that we get from the I Can Lead program, and also um, he's very instrumental in helping us get Islamic uh, services at the detention center as well as study uh, groups, and so I really appreciate the, um, him being part of the team at the detention center and helping us out there. I think what I'd like to do a little bit is talk a little bit about the incarceration problem, um, both here in Howard County, but also in the United States. Um, I believe it's an epidemic, and I believe uh, I'd like to put myself out of business, not, not maybe quite right yet, because I retire in about six months, but uh, not long after that, or, or I'd like to see that happen. And I'm not sure if enough is really discussed about this, but there are 2.3 million people incarcerated in the United States. Something wrong with that. Um, we have the highest incarceration rate in the world, second to nobody. We spend $68 billion a year operating jails and prisons across the United States. We spend $5.1 billion a year in new prison and jail construction a year. There are nine million people released from local jails every year, and 750,000 people released from state prisons every year. Of all the people that are incarcerated, 95% of them are coming home. And I think here's the statistic that, that troubles me the most and has changed the scope of my job. 66% of the people released from jails and prison will reoffend within three years. 52% will be reincarcerated within three years. That is a troubling statistic and one that I think has finally gotten the attention of people in my business as well as political leaders and leaders across all spectrums of society. And <clears throat> I think if you asked a correctional administrator maybe 10, 20 years ago, what was your role? And it basically would be to uh, securely and safely incarcerate, confine someone, make sure the basic services were provided. That, that now has changed dramatically. If you now ask a correctional administrator what their role is, they're going to tell you those things, and they're also going to tell you that their role is to help transition offenders back to the community and to do it in a way that enhances public safety and maybe knocks down some of these statistics when you look at 66% of our population being returned. And there's this new um, phrase in, the, in my business, it's called reentry, And it's really helping people to get back into the community, to re-enter society. Um, I went to a uh, conference some years back when I was with the state correction system. It was held out in uh, California, and it was um, sponsored by the Justice Department, and they had brought groups from all over the country. And there was a, um, a group from Washington State that was there at the request of their governor. It was, it was a discussion of reentry and offenders coming back to the community. And each, each state that was participating in this forum talked about what they were doing and why it was important. As one gentleman said, well, I'm a citizen representative from Washington State. I was sent here by our governor to listen to this. And he said, I think it's a bunch of do-gooder stuff. And I said, well, do you pay taxes? Because you should be more interested in the cost of incarceration, both what I talked about and the impacts on families and what that does to the families. We've got to do a better job. And so reentry isn't just some do-gooder thing. It's really a big public safety policy initiative because the impact of crime on our community is, is pretty devastating. And now corrections administrators across the country are trying to scramble to do everything that they can do to have an impact on this. What does that mean? means a couple of things. 
One is we have to identify people at, at, in their risk. And we're very fortunate in Howard County right now in that we have uh, been awarded a technical assistance grant from the Department of Justice to look at exactly how we do that. And one of the things that we've been advised is you have to be very careful about who you target services towards. And so we're working diligently with them to come up with tools to do that. And basically it runs the gamut of people that are high risk, medium risk, low risk, and where do you put your resources? And we're targeting the people that are the higher to the medium risk to make sure that they get the services necessary. We're also looking at their motivation to be changed and productive citizens. And there's things that are helping us do that where in the past we've used our sort of collective wisdom and experience to make those decisions and now there's a lot more sophisticated instruments. And the issue is, is besides risk assessments, what are the need assessments? What are the things that impact people coming to jail or returning to jail? And there's a lot of research out there and we're really trying to tap into that. But there's a lot of important things that we need to do. One is education. 33% of our population at Howard County does not have their high school diploma. What jobs can you get nowadays without some kind of education? What doors can you get into to apply for jobs? And employment is directly connected, again, to being productive and also contributing to society. And, and unfortunately, unemployment and incarceration are also very heavily tied together. So we have an education program sponsored by Howard Community College. They also teach a life skills program that teaches inmates basic skills and computer literacy. Um, also how to interview and communicate better so that when they interview for jobs, they're able to interview well with employers, uh, able to state why they need to be given a chance, talk about the um, tax credit programs that are available for ex-offenders to, uh, to, to give to employers as well as bonding programs that'll help take some of the risks that employers may be concerned about. And so those are important. And of course, addictions and substance abuse. Unfortunately, 67% of our population has some type of significant history of substance abuse. Along with that, you know, what, what other issues that we've been told need to be targeted are criminogenic factors that, how people think and how they associate with others. And so it's real important that we address those issues through some cognitive skills tr programs. But also the religious services have also shown to have a tremendous impact on our population. And uh, what I find very interesting is uh, a lot of our inmates are real motivated to go to services when they're in jail, but somehow that sort of wanes sometimes when they are on the way out. So what we're now asking is for the faith-based community to come in and work with us and then help transition people into the community and keep that commitment to their faith while on the way out the door and create that support system while transitioning to the community. It's very difficult for offenders going back to the community and all the things that they have to do. And without that support system, it's very difficult to navigate all the requirements that they have, especially if they're on supervision in the community when they get out. And the work that the um, I Can Lead program uh, provides at the detention center addresses a lot of this. Uh, one of the other big things to target is how people think about themselves <clears throat> and whether they have self-respect and think they're the, that they're capable. And by using the core courses as well as the education and skill training um, modules, that we, we can address those things and make a difference. Um, the key to this often is, is that we used to work in stovepipes. Inside the detention center, we would do our job the community would sort of be kept out in, in many cases in correctional facilities and not allowed to come in. And so we hand off people and, and there's, there's a disconnect. There's a time where that support 
often breaks down. And that's why what we're trying to do now is open up the correctional facilities more and more to allow groups in to provide the necessary services and provide the leadership necessary to help transition our offenders back. We've recently hired a reentry coordinator that's working with the faith-based community, um, programs in the community that offer mental health and addiction services, housing services, employment services, to try to make that transition, again, as seamless as possible and provide the case management and support network also available. So we can't do it by ourselves. Um, it's not for correctional administrators to uh, be able to do it alone. It's, it's a group effort that really needs uh, all of our help. And I, <clears throat> I truly believe it is an epidemic. I think it's something wrong when we have one of the most prosperous uh, countries in the world, yet we lead the world in, in the rate of incarceration. There's something wrong with that. And I think we have to do a very different approach. Uh, and I, I thank Ayman for his willingness to step up to the plate and others. Mohammed's here, he's been involved. Uh, it does make a difference. The inmate population has reported back to us um, that it's a benefit to them. They see that it can help them in their desire to uh, be productive. And without the help of those uh, in the community, we can't do it. So uh, I'm willing to take any questions or anybody has any um, comments. <coughs> Yeah, as far as statistics on what's successful, the I Can Lead program, we've not, we've just started, so there's, there's, no, there's been no tracking of that. But I can tell you that correctional education programs have been studied, and they show, you know, 25% um, impact in recidivism. So if you participate in at least 60 days of a correctional education program, your, the recidivism rate for those participants is 25% less than those who don't. Uh, substance abuse, same thing. Those who complete our substance abuse program, about a 24 percent greater uh, or redu greater reduction in recidivism for those who have gone through that. As far as the rejection piece go, our life skills program does a lot to try to get them to understand that um, they're going to face it. Uh, a lot of employers, uh, fortunately in the community, will give people a second chance, and we connect with a lot of those. We connect with as, as many of the um, faith-based um, groups in Howard County as we can because that's where the real support has to be, I believe. It, it's not the parole and probation agents, not that I'm saying that they can't provide some, but I believe it's the community um, providers and the faith-based uh, groups in the community that do the best of, of that. And so that, that's why it's important to get these programs in, the I Can Lead program, because they're going to target that. And that's going to be a priority, and they're going to give the support. You know, when I go in to talk to our graduates from our life skills program, I, I tell them that, uh, you know, rejection doesn't always mean it's because they're an ex-offender. It oftentimes, rejection now might be that there is there's no job out there for them. Um, and so they have to be careful not to put everything on the fact that if things don't come their way in terms of, employment or even sometimes housing, it's not because of their status, it just may be the economic times that unfortunately we are in. And in, unfortunately also in Howard County, getting housing is very, very difficult because it's expensive and there's a lack of, of affordable housing and our county executive is making a real effort to address that, um, to you know, make it affordable for people who are struggling. Uh, and there's some, some good initiatives coming down the road with our housing department to set aside some low-income housing for our ex-offenders coming out of the, the detention center, so. Um, yes, um, I believe we're, in terms of who, when the offenders come into the detention center, we ask religious preference. And that, that changes because our population turns over, but it's, it's probably running around 3 to 4 percent, which I guess right about now would be about 15 um, Muslims who have, uh, you know, said that that's their, their, their faith of preference. 
the number of Muslim uh, inmates in the detention center. We are probably on the low end. If you, if a lot of the state facilities I worked in, the, the percentage would be much higher. Um, and it depends, I guess, you know, where you are in the state as to what that percentage might be. Many of the state facilities are probably on, on the 25 percent um, range, to 25 to 30 percent range even. Uh, so uh, Howard County has a low number, uh, but there are facilities throughout the state that have a higher number of Muslims. Thank you, Dr. This is great insights. And um, just to reiterate the point, um, it's not just healthy numbers, but it's the diversity now of the Muslim population in these facilities. Um, there's people from inner city, immigrants, Caucasians, it's, it's pretty much the whole spectrum. And uh, it's people in our community that we see every day, you know, people get locked up for a couple of weeks for, for different reasons. So uh, there's definitely a lot of pressure on the youth. Um, Chicago, Minnesota has a great problem as well with gangs. Um, you know, the Somali Muslim That's population right. there. Human trafficking, I mean, big, big, major problem. Um, I know Jeff has to, to run out of here as soon as he probably could. So I want to thank him again for, for his time. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.